Section thirty eight of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty seven The Shipwreck. Ten days had elapsed since the incidents related in the preceding chapter. The scene changes to an island in the Mediterranean Sea. There, seated on the strand, with garments dripping wet, and with all the silken richness of her raven hair floating wildly and dishevelled over her shoulders, the Lady Nisida gazed vacantly on the ocean, now tinged with living gold by the morning sun. At a short distance, a portion of a shipwrecked vessel lay upon the shore, and seemed to tell her tale. But where were the desperate, daring crew who had manned the gallant bark? Where were those fearless freebooters who six days previously had sailed from Leghorn on their piratical voyage? Where were those who hoisted the flag of peace and assumed the demeanour of honest trader when in port, but who on the broad bosom of the ocean carried the terrors of their black banner far and wide? Where, too, was Stefano Verina, who had so boldly carried off the Lady Nisida? The gallant bark had struck upon a shoal during the tempest and the obscurity of the night, and the pilot knew not where they were. His reckoning was lost, his calculations had all been set at naught by the confusion produced by the fearful storm which had assailed the ship and driven her from her course. The moment the corsair galley struck, that confusion increased to such an extent that the captain lost all control over his men, the pilot's voice was unheeded likewise. The crew got out the long boat and leaped into it, forcing the captain and the pilot to enter it with them. Stefano Verina, who was on deck when the vessel struck, rushed down into the cabin appropriated to Nisida, and by signs endeavoured to convey to her a sense of the danger which menaced them. Conquering her ineffable aversion for the bandit, Nisida followed him hastily to the deck. At the same instant that her eyes plunged, as it were, into the dense obscurity which prevailed around, the lightning streamed in long and vivid flashes over the turbulent waters, and with the roar of the billows suddenly mingled deafening shrieks and cries, shrieks and cries of wild despair, as the longboat, which had been pushed away from the corsair bark, went down at a little distance. And as the lightning played upon the raging sea, Nisida and Verena caught hurried but frightful glimpses of many human faces, whereon was expressed the indescribable agony of the drowning. Perdition, cried Verena, all are gone save Nisida and myself, and shall we too perish ere she has become mine? Shall death separate us ere I have revelled in her charms? Fool that I was to delay my triumph hitherto, fool that I was to be overawed by her impetuous signs, or melted by her silent though strong appeals. He paced the deck in an excited manner as he uttered these words aloud no he exclaimed wildly as the tempest seemed to increase and the ship was thrown further on shoal she shall not escape me thus after all i have done and dared in order to possess her our funeral may take place to-night but our bridal shall be first ha ha and he laughed with a kind of despairing mockery while the fragments of the vessel's sails flapped against the spars with a din as if some mighty demon were struggling with the blast the sense of appalling danger seemed to madden Stefano only because it threatened to separate him from Nisida, and fearfully excited, he rushed toward her, crying wildly, You shall be mine. But how terrible was the yell which burst from his lips, when by a glare of a brilliant flash of lightning, he beheld Nisida cast herself over the side of the vessel. For a single instant he fell back, appalled, horror-struck, but at the next he plunged with insensate fury after her, all the rage of the storm redoubled. When the misty shades of morning cleared away, and the storm had passed, Nisida was seated alone upon the strand, having miraculously escaped that eternal night of death which leads to no dawn. But where was Stefano Verina? She knew not, although she naturally conjectured, and even hoped, that he was numbered with the dead. End of section 38《セクション39のワークナルワールフ by George W. M. Reynolds。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Chapter 38: The Island in the Mediterranean Sea。Fair and beauteous was the Mediterranean Isle whereon the Lady Nisida had been thrown. When the morning mists had dispersed, 
and the sunbeams tinged the ridges of the hills and the summits of the tallest trees nisida awoke as it were from the profound lethargic reverie in which she had been plunged for upward of an hour since the moment when the billows had borne her safely to the shore the temperature of that island was warm and genial for there eternal summer reigned and thus though her garments were still dripping wet nisida experienced no cold she rose from the bank of sand whereon she had been seated and cast anxious rapid and searching glances around her not a human being met her eyes but in the woods that stretched with emerald pride almost down to the golden sands the birds and insects nature's free commoners sent forth the sounds of life and welcomed the advent of the morn with that music of the groves the scenery which now presented itself to the contemplation of nisida was indescribably beautiful richly wooded hills rose towering above each other with amphitheatrical effect and behind the verdant panorama were the blue outlines of pinnacles of naked rocks but not a trace of the presence of human beings was to be seen not a hamlet nor a cottage nor the slightest sign of agriculture at a short distance lay a portion of the wreck of the corsair ship the fury of the tempest of the preceding night had thrown it so high upon the shoal whereon it had struck and the sea was now comparatively so calm that nisida was enabled to approach close up to it with little difficulty she succeeded in reaching the deck that deck whose elastic surface lately vibrated to the tread of many daring desperate young men but now desolate and broken in many parts the cabin which had been allotted to her or rather to which she had been confined was in the portion of the wreck that still remained and there she found a change of raiment which stefano had provided ere the vessel left leghorn carefully packing up these garments in as small and portable a compass as possible she fastened the burden upon her shoulders by the means of a cord and quitting the vessel conveyed it safe and dry to the shore then she returned again to the wreck in search of provisions considerable quantities of which she fortunately found to be uninjured by the water and these she was enabled to transport to the strand by means of several journeys backward and forward between the shore and the wreck the occupation was not only necessary in order to provide the wherewith to sustain life but it also abstracted her thoughts from a too painful contemplation of her position it was long past the hour of noon when she had completed her task and the shore in the immediate vicinity of the wreck was piled with a miscellaneous assortment of objects bags of provisions weapons of defence articles of the toilet clothing pieces of canvas cordage and carpenter's tools then wearied with her arduous toils she laid aside her dripping garments bathed her beauteous form in the sea and attired herself in dry apparel having partaken of some refreshment she armed herself with weapons of defence and quitting the shore entered upon that vast amphitheatre of verdure to which we all have already slightly alluded the woods were thick and tangled but though when seen from the shore they appeared to form one dense uninterrupted forest yet they in reality only dotted the surface of the island with numerous detached patches of grove and copse and in the intervals were verdant plains or delicious valleys exhibiting not the slightest sign of agriculture but interspaced with shrubs and trees laden with fruits rich and tempting nature had indeed profusely showered her bounties over that charming isle for the trees glowed with their blushing or golden produce as if gems were the fruitage of every bough through one of the delicious valleys which nisida explored a streamlet smooth as a looking-glass wound its way to its sunny bank did the lady repair and the pebbly bed of the river was seen as plainly through the limpid waters as an eyeball through a tear though alone was nisida in that vale and though many bitter reflections deep regrets and vague apprehensions crowded upon her soul yet the liveliness of the scene appeared to diminish the intenseness of the feelings of utter solitude and its soft influence partially lulled the waves of her emotions for never had mortal eyes beheld finer fruit upon the trees nor lovelier flowers upon the soil all life was rejoicing from the grasshopper at her feet to the feathered songsters in the myrtle citron and olive groves and the swan glided past to the music of the stream above the heavens were more clear than her own italian clime more blue than any colour that tinges the flowers of the earth 
she roved along the smiling bank with which fringed the stream until the setting sun dyed with the richest purple the rocky pinnacles in the distance and made the streamlet glow like a golden flood and nisida alone in the radiance and glory of her own charms alone amidst all the radiance and glory of the charms of nature the beauteous nisida appeared to be the queen of that mediterranean isle but whether it were really an island or a portion of the three continents which hem in that tireless ocean the lady as yet knew not warned by the splendours of the setting sun to retrace her way she turned and sped back to the strand where the stores she had saved from the wreck were heaped up when first she had set out upon her exploring ramble she had expected every moment to behold human forms her fellow creatures emerge from the woods but the more she saw of that charming spot whereon her destinies had thrown her the fainter grew the hope or the fear we scarcely know which to term the expectation for no sign of the presence of man was there nature appeared to be the undisputed empress of that land and nisa returned to the shore with the conviction that she was the sole human inhabitant of this delicious region and now once more seated upon the strand while the last beams of the sun played upon the wide blue waters of the mediterranean nisida partook of her frugal repast consisting of the bread supplied by the wreck and a few fruits which she gathered in the valley the effects of the tempest had totally disappeared in respect to the sea which now lay stretched in glassy stillness it seemed as if a holy calm soft as an infant sleep lay upon the bosom of the mediterranean now no longer terrible with storm but a mighty emblem of mild majesty and rest nisida thought of the fury which had lately convulsed that sea now so placid and sighed at the conviction which was forced upon her that no such calm was for the mortal breast when storms had once been there for she pondered on her native land now perhaps far oh how far away and the images of those whom she loved appeared to rise before her francisco in despair at his sister's unaccountable disappearance and ferdinand perchance already doomed to die and tears flowed down her cheeks and trickled upon her snowy bosom gleaming like dew amongst lilies of what avail was the energy of her character in that land along whose coast stretched the impassable barrier of the sea oh it was enough to make even the haughty nisida weep and to produce a terrible impression on a mind hitherto acting only in obedience to its own indomitable will though the sun had set some time and no moon had yet appeared in the purple sky yet it was far from dark an azure mantle of twilight seemed to wrap the earth the sea the heavens and so soft so overpowering was the influence of the scene and of the night that slumber gradually stole upon the lady's eyes there now upon the warm sand slept nisida and when the chaste advent of the moon bathed all in silver as the sun had for twelve hours steeped all in gold the beams of the goddess of the night played on her charming countenance without wakening her the raven masses of her hair lay upon her flushed cheeks like midnight on a bed of roses her long black lashes reposed on those cheeks so surpassingly lovely with their rich carnation hues for she dreamt of ferdinand and her vision was a happy one imagination played wild tricks with a shipwrecked lonely lady as if to recompense her for the waking realities of her sad position she thought that she was reposing in the delicious valley which she had explored in the afternoon she thought that ferdinand was her companion that she lay in his arms that his lips pressed hers that she was all to him as he was all to her and that love's cup of enjoyment was full to the very brim but oh when she slowly awoke and under the influence of the delightful vision raised her eyes in the dewy light of voluptuous languor to the blue sky above her the sunbeams that were heralding in another day cruelly dispelled the enchanting illusions of a warm and excited fancy and nisida found herself alone on the seashore of the island thus the glory of that sunrise held no charms for her although never had the orb of day come forth with greater pomp nor to shine on a lovelier scene no words can convey an idea of the rapid development of every feature in the landscape the deeper and deepening tint of the glowing sky the roseate hue of the mountain peaks as they stood out against the cloudless orient and the rich emerald shades of the woods sparkling with fruit the fragrant rose and the chaste lily the blushing peony and the gaudy tulip and all the choicest flowers of that delicious clime 
expanded into renowned loveliness to greet the sun and the citron and the orange the melon and the grape the pomegranate and the date drank in the yellow light to nourish their golden hues nisida's eyes glanced rapidly over the vast expanse of waters and swept the horizon but there was not a sail nor even a cloud which imagination might transform into the white wing of a distant ship and now upon the golden sand the lovely nisida put off her garments one by one and set at liberty the dark masses of her shining hair which floated like an ample veil of raven blackness over the dazzling whiteness of her skin imagination might have invested her forehead with a halo so magnificent was the lustrous effect of the sun upon the silken glossiness of that luxuriant hair the mediterranean was the lady's bath and in spite of the impressive nature of the waking thoughts which had succeeded her delicious dream in spite of that conviction of loneliness which lay like a weight of lead upon her soul she disported in the waters like a mermaid now she plunged beneath the surface which glowed in the sun like a vast lake of quicksilver now she stood in a shallow spot where the water rippled no higher than her middle and combed out her dripping tresses then she waded further in and seemed to rejoice in allowing the little wavelets to kiss her snowy bosom no fear had she indeed no thought of the monsters of the deep could the fair surface of the shining water conceal aught dangerous or aught terrible oh yes even as beneath that snowy breast beat a heart stained with crime often alighted by ardent and impetuous passions and devoured by raging desire for nearly an hour did nisida disport in nature's mighty bath until the heat of the sun became so intense that she was compelled to return to the shore and resume her apparel then she took some bread in her hand and hastened to the groves to pluck the cooling and delicious fruits whereof there was so marvellous an abundance she seated herself on a bed of wild flowers on the shady side of a citron and orange grove surrounded by a perfumed air before her stretched the valley like a vast carpet of bright green velvet fantastically embroidered with flowers of a thousand varied hues and in the midst meandered the crystal stream with stately swans and an infinite number of other aquatic birds floating on its bosom and the birds of the groves too how beautiful were they and how joyous did they seem what variated plumage did they display as they flew past the lady nisida unscared by her presence some of them alighted from the overhanging boughs and as they descended swept her very hair with their wings then almost to convince her that she was not an unwelcome intruder in that charming land they hopped round her picking up the crumbs of bread which she scattered about to attract them for the loneliness of her condition had already attuned the mind of this strange being to the susceptibility of deriving amusement from incidents which a short time previously she would have looked upon as the most insane triflings thus was the weariness of her thoughts relieved by disporting in the water as we ere now saw her or by contemplating the playfulness of the birds presently she wandered into the vale and gathered a magnificent nosegay of flowers then the whim struck her that she would weave for herself a chaplet of roses and as her work progressed she improved upon it and fashioned a beauteous diadem of flowers to protect her head from the scorching noonday sun but think not o oh reader that while thus diverting herself with trivialities of which she would scarcely have deemed the haughty imperious active disposition of nisida of riverola to be capable think not that her mind was altogether abstracted from unpleasant thoughts no far very far from that she was merely relieved from a portion of that weight which oppressed her but her entire burden could not be removed from her soul there were moments when her grief amounted almost to despair was she doomed to pass the remainder of her existence in that land was it really an island and unknown to navigators she feared so for did it join a continent its loveliness and fruitfulness would not have permitted it to remain long unoccupied by those who must of necessity discover it and oh what would her brother think of her absence what would ferdinand conjecture and what perils might not at that moment envelop her lover while she was not near to succour him by means of her artifice her machinations or her gold ten thousand thousand maledictions upon stefano who was the cause of all her present misery ten thousand thousand maledictions on her own folly for not having exerted all her energies and all her faculties to escape from his power ere she was conveyed on board the corsair ship and it was too late but useless now were regrets and repinings 
for the past could not be recalled and the future might have much happiness in store for nisida for oh sweetest comes the hope which is lured back because its presence is indispensable and oppressed as nisida was with the weight of her misfortunes her soul was too energetic too sanguine too impetuous to yield to despair day after day passed and still not a ship appeared nisa did not penetrate much further into the island than the valley which we have described and whither she was accustomed to repair to gather the flowers that she wove into diadems she lingered for the most part near the shore on which she had been thrown fearing lest if away a ship might pass in her absence each day she bathed her beauteous form in the mediterranean each day she devoted some little time to the adornment of her person with a wreath of flowers she wove crowns for her head necklaces bracelets and scarves combining the flowers so as to form the most wild and fanciful devices and occasionally surveying herself in the natural mirror afforded her by the limpid stream purposely weaving an apparel as scanty as possible on account of the oppressive heat which prevailed during each day of twelve long hours and which was not materially moderated at night she supplied to some extent the place of the superfluous garments thus thrown aside by means of tissues of cool refreshing fragrant flowers thus by the time she had been ten or twelve days upon the island her appearance seemed most admirably to correspond with her new and lonely mode of life and the spot where her destinies had cast her habited in a single linen garment confined round the slender waist with a cestus of flowers and with light slippers upon her feet but with a diadem of roses on her head and with wreaths round her bare arms and her equally bare ankles she appeared to be the goddess of that island the genius of that charming clime of fruits and verdure and crystal streams and flowers the majesty of her beauty was softened and thus enhanced by the wonderful simplicity of her attire the dazzling brilliancy of her charms was subdued by the chaste the innocent the primitive aspect with which those fantastically woven flowers invested her even the extraordinary lustre of her fine dark eyes was moderated by the gaudy yet elegant assemblage of hues formed by those flowers which she wore was it not strange that she whose soul we have hitherto seen bent on deeds or schemes of stern and important nature who never acted without a motive and whose mind was far too deeply occupied with worldly cares and pursuits to bestow a thought on trifles who indeed would have despised herself had she wasted a moment in toying with a flower or watching the playful motions of a bird was it not strange that nisida should have become so changed as we now find her in that island of which she was the queen conceive that same nisida who planned dark plots against flora francatelli now tripping along the banks of a sunlit stream bedecked with flowers and playing with the swans imagine that same being who dealt death to agnes now seated beneath the shade of myrtles and embowering vines distributing bread or pomegranate seeds to the birds that hopped cheerfully around her picture to yourself that woman of majestic beauty whom you have seen clad in black velvet and wearing a dark thick veil now weaving for herself garments of flowers and wandering in the lightest possible attire by the seashore or by the rippling stream or amidst the mazes of the fruit-laden groves and sometimes as she sat upon the yellow sand gazing on the wavelets of the mediterranean that were racing one another like living things from some far-off region to that lovely but lonely isle it would seem as if all the low and sweet voices of the sea never loud and sullen now since the night of storm which cast her on that strand were heard by her and made delicious music to her ears in that island must we leave her now for a short space leave her to her birds her flowers and her mermaid sports in the sea leave her also to her internals of dark and dismal thoughts and to her long but ineffectual watchings for the appearance of a sail in the horizon end of section thirty nine section forty of wagner the werewolf by george w n reynolds this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty nine the werewolf it was the last day of the month and the hour of sunset was fast approaching great was the sensation that prevailed throughout the city of florence rumour had industriously spread and with equal assiduity exaggerated the particulars of ferdinand wagner's trial and the belief that a man on whom the horrible destiny of a werewolf had been entailed was about to suffer the extreme penalty of the law 
was generally prevalent the great square of the ducal palace where the scaffold was erected was crowded with the florentine populace and the windows were literally alive with human faces various were the emotions and feelings which influenced that mass of spectators the credulous and superstitious forming more than nine-tenths of the whole multitude shook their heads and commented amongst themselves in subdued whispers on the profane rashness of the chief judge who dared to doubt the existence of such a being as a werewolf a few who shared the scepticism of the judge applauded that high functionary for his courage in venturing so bold a stroke in order to destroy what he and they deemed an idle superstition but the great mass were dominated by a profound and indeed most painful sensation of awe curiosity induced them to remain though their misgivings prompted them to fly from the spot which had been fixed upon for the execution the flowers of florentine loveliness and never in any age did the republic boast of so much female beauty were present but bright eyes flashed forth uneasy glances and snowy bosoms beat with alarms and fair hands trembled in the lover's pressure in the midst of the square was raised a high platform covered with black cloth and presenting an appearance so ominous and sinister that it was but little calculated to revive the spirits of the timid on this scaffold was a huge block and near the block stood the headsman carelessly leaning on his axe the steel of which was polished and bright as silver a few minutes before the hour of sunset the chief judge the procurator fiscal the two assistant judges and the lieutenant of sbirri attended by a turnkey and several subordinate police officers were repairing in procession along the corridor leading to the doomed prisoner's cell the chief judge alone was dignified in manner and he alone wore a demeanour denoting resolution and at the same time self-possession those who accompanied him were without a single exception a prey to the most lively fear and it was evident that had they dared to absent themselves they would not have been present on this occasion at length the door of the prisoner's cell was reached and there the procession paused the moment is now at hand said the chief judge when a monstrous and ridiculous superstition imported into our country from that cradle and nurse of preposterous legends germany shall be annihilated for ever this knave who is about to suffer has doubtless propagated the report of his lupine destiny in order to inspire terror and thus prosecute his career of crime and infamy with the greater security from chances of molestation for this end he painted the picture which appalled so many of you in the judgment hall but which believe my friends he did not always believe destined to retain its sable covering well did he know that the curiosity of a servant or of a friend would obtain a peep beneath the mystic veil and he calculated that the terror with which he sought to invest himself would be enhanced by the rumours and representations spread by those who had thus penetrated into its feigned secrets but let us not waste that time which now verges toward a crisis whereby doubt shall be dispelled and a ridiculous superstition destroyed for ever at this moment a loud a piercing and an agonizing cry burst from the interior of the cell the knave has overheard me and would fain strike terror to your hearts exclaimed the chief judge then in a still louder tone he commanded the turnkey to open the door of the dungeon but when the man approached so strange so awful so appalling were the sounds which came from the interior of the cell that he threw down the key in dismay and rushed from the dreadful vicinity my lord i implore you to pause said the procurator fiscal trembling from head to foot would you have me render myself ridiculous in the eyes of all florence demanded the chief judge sternly yet so strange were now the noises which came from the interior of the dungeon so piercing the cries of agony so violent the rustling and tossing on the stone floor that for the first time this bold functionary entertained a partial misgiving as if he had indeed gone too far but retreat was impossible and with desperate resolution the chief judge picked up the key and thrust it into the lock his assistants the procurator fiscal and the sbirri drew back with instinctive horror as the bolts groaned in the iron work which held them the chain fell with a clanking sound and as the door was opened the horrible monster burst forth from the dungeon with a terrific howl yells and cries of despair reverberated through the long corridor and those sounds were for an instant broken by that of the falling of a heavy body twas the chief judge hurled down and dashed violently against the rough uneven masonry 
by the mad careering of the werewolf as the monster burst from his cell on on he sped with the velocity of lightning along the corridor giving vent to howls of the most horrifying description fainting with terror the assistant judges the procurator fiscal and the sbirri were for a few moments so overcome by the appalling scene they had just witnessed that they thought not of raising the chief judge who lay motionless on the pavement but at length some of the police officers so far recovered themselves as to be able to devote attention to that higher functionary it was however too late his skull was fractured by the violence with which he had been dashed against the rough wall and his brains were scattered on the pavement those who now bent over his disfigured corpse exchanged looks of unutterable horror in the meantime the werewolf had cleared the corridor rapid as an arrow shot from the bow he sprung bounding up a flight of steep stone stairs as if the elastic air bore him on and rushing through an open door burst suddenly upon the crowd that was so anxiously waiting to behold the procession issue thence terrific was the yell that the multitude sent forth a yell formed of a thousand combining voices so long so loud so wildly agonizing that never had the welkin rung with so appalling an ebullition of human misery before madly rushed the wolf amidst the people dashing them aside overturning them hurling them down bursting through the mass too dense to clear a passage of its own accord and making the scene of horror more horrible still by mingling his hideous howlings with the cries the shrieks the screams that escaped from a thousand tongues no pen can describe the awful scene of confusion and death which now took place swayed by no panic fear but influenced by terrors of dreadful reality the people exerted all their force to escape from that spot and thus the struggling crushing pushing crowding fighting and all the oscillations of a multitude set in motion by the direst alarms were succeeded by the most fatal results women were thrown down and trampled to death strong men were scarcely able to maintain their footing many females were literally suffocated in the pressure of the crowd and mothers with young children in their arms excited no sympathy never was the selfishness of human nature more strikingly displayed than on this occasion no one bestowed a thought upon his neighbour the chivalrous florentine citizens dashed aside the weak and helpless female who barred his way with as little remorse as if she were not a being of flesh and blood and even husbands forgot their wives lovers abandoned their mistresses and parents waited not an instant to succour their daughters oh it was a terrible thing to contemplate that dense mass oscillating furiously like the waves of the sea sending up to heaven such appalling sounds of misery rushing furiously toward the avenues of egress falling back baffled and crushed in a struggle where only the very strongest prevailed labouring to escape from death and fighting for life fluctuating and rushing and wailing in maddening excitement like a raging ocean oh all this wrought a direful sublimity with those cries of agony and that riot of desperation and all this while the wolf pursued its furious career amid the mortal violence of a people thrown into horrible disorder pursued its way with savage howls glaring eyes and foaming mouth the only living being there that was infuriate and not alarmed battling for escape and yet unhurt as a whirlpool suddenly assails the gallant ship makes her agitate and rock fearfully for a few moments and then swallows her up altogether so was the scaffold in the midst of the square shaken to its very basis for a little space and then hurled down disappearing altogether amidst the living vortex in the balconies and at the windows overlooking the square the awful excitement spread like wildfire and a real panic prevailed among those who were at least beyond the reach of danger but horror paralysed the power of sober reflection and the hideous spectacle of volumes of human beings battling and roaring and rushing and yelling in terrific frenzy produced a kindred effect and spread the wild delirium among the spectators at those balconies and those windows at length in the square below the crowds began to pour forth from the gates for the werewolf had by this time cleared himself a passage and escaped from the midst of that living ocean so fearfully agitated by the storms of fear but even when the means of egress were thus obtained the most frightful disorder prevailed the people rolling in heaps upon the heaps while infuriate and agile men ran on the tops of the compact masses and leapt in their delirium as with barbarous intent 
on on spread the werewolf dashing like a whirlwind through the streets leading to the open country the white flakes of foam flying from his mouth like spray from the prow of a vessel and every fibre of his frame vibrating as if in agony and oh what dismay what terror did that monster spread in the thoroughfares through which he passed how wildly how madly flew the men and women from his path how piteously screamed the children at the house doors in the poor neighbourhoods but as if sated with the destruction already wrought in the great square of the palace the wolf dealt death no more in the precincts of the city as if lashed on by invisible demons his aim or his instinct was to escape the streets are threaded the suburbs of the city are passed the open country is gained and now along the bank of the arno rushes the monster by the margin of that pure stream to whose enchanting vale the soft twilight leads a more delicious charm on the verge of a grove with its full budding branches all impatient for the spring a lover and his mistress were murmuring fond language to each other in the soft twilight blushed the maiden less in bashfulness than in her own soul's emotion her countenance displaying all the magic beauty not only of feature but of feeling and she raised her large blue eyes in the dewy light of a sweet enthusiasm to the skies as the handsome youth by her side pressed her fair hand and said we must now part until to-morrow darling of my soul how calmly has this day with all its life and brightness passed away into the vast tomb of eternity it has gone without a single hour's unhappiness for us gone without leaving a regret on our minds gone too without clouds in the heavens or mists upon the earth most beautiful even at the moment of its parting to-morrow beloved one will unite us again in your parents cot and renewed happiness the youth stopped and the maiden clung to him in speechless terror for an ominous sound as of a rushing animal and then a terrific howl burst upon their ears no time had they for flight not a moment even to collect their scattered thoughts the infuriate wolf came bounding over the greensward the youth uttered a wild and fearful cry a scream of agony burst from the lips of the maiden as she was dashed from her lover's arms and in another moment the monster had swept by but what misery what desolation had his passage wrought though unhurt by his glistening fangs though unwounded by his sharp claws yet the maiden an instant before so enchanting in her beauty so happy in her love lay stretched on the cold turf the cause of life snapped suddenly by that transition from perfect bliss to the most appalling terror and still the wolf rushed madly wildly on it was an hour past sunrise and from a grove in the immediate neighbourhood of leghorn a man came forth his countenance though wondrously handsome was deadly pale traces of mental horror and anguish remained on those classically chiselled features and in those fine eloquent eyes his garments were soiled blood-stained and torn this man was fernand wagner he entered the city of leghorn and purchased a change of attire for which he paid from a purse well filled with gold he then repaired to a hostel or public tavern where he performed the duties of the toilet and obtained the refreshment of which he appeared to stand so much in need by this time his countenance was again composed and the change which new attire and copious abulation had made in his appearance was so great that no one who had seen him issue from the grove and beheld him now could have believed in the identity of the person quitting the hostel he repaired to the port where he instituted inquiries relative to a particular vessel which he described and which had sailed from leghorn upward of a fortnight previously he soon obtained the information which he sought and an old sailor to whom he had addressed himself not only hinted that the vessel in question was suspected when in the harbour to be of a piratical character but also declared that he himself had seen a lady conveyed on board during the night preceding the departure of the ship further inquiries convinced wagner that the lady spoken of had been carried by force and against her will to the corsair vessel and he was now certain that the demon had not deceived him and that he had indeed obtained a trace of his lost nisida his mind was immediately resolved how to act and his measures were as speedily taken guided by the advice of the old sailor from whom he had gleaned the information he sought he was enabled to purchase a fine vessel and equip her for sea within the space of a few days he lavished his gold with no niggard hand 
and gold is a wondrous talisman to remove obstacles and facilitate designs in a word on the sixth morning after his arrival at leghorn ferdinand wagner embarked on board his ship which was manned with a gallant crew and carried ten pieces of ordnance a favouring breeze prevailed at the time and the gallant bark set sail for the levant End of section 40. Section 41 of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 40. Wagner in Search of Nisida. The reader may perhaps be surprised that Ferdinand Wagner should have been adventurous enough to trust himself to the possibilities of a protracted voyage since every month his form must undergo a frightful change, a destiny which he naturally endeavoured to shroud in the profoundest secrecy. But it must be recollected that the Mediterranean is dotted with numerous islands, and he knew that, however changeable or adverse the winds might be, it would always prove an easy matter to make such arrangements as to enable him to gain some port a few days previously to the close of the month. Moreover, so strong, so intense was his love for Nisida, that, even without the prospect afforded by this calculation he would have dared all perils incurred all risks exposed himself to all hostile chances rather than have remained inactive while he believed her to be in the power of a desperate ruthless bandit for oh ever present to his mind was the image of the lost fair one by day when the sun lighted up with smiles the dancing waves over which his vessel bounded merrily merrily and by night when the moon shone like a silver lamp amidst the curtains of heaven's pavilion his was not the love which knows only passionate impulse it was a constant unvarying tender sentiment far far more pure and therefore more permanent than the ardent and burning love which nisida felt for him his was not the love which possession would satiate and enjoyment cool down it was a feeling that had gained a soft yet irresistible empire over his heart and that love of his was nurtured and sustained by the most generous thoughts he pictured to himself the happiness he should experience in becoming the constant companion of one whose loss of hearing and of speech cut her off as it were from that communication with the world which is so grateful to her sex he imagined to himself with all the fond idolatry of sincere affection how melodiously soft how tremendously clear would be her voice were it restored to her and were it first used to articulate the delicious language of love and then he thought how enchanting how fascinating how fraught with witching charms would be the conversation of a being endowed with so glorious an intellect were she able to enjoy the faculty of speech thus did her very imperfections constitute a ravishing theme for his meditation and the more he indulged in dreams like these the more resolute did he become never to rest until he had discovered and rescued her seven days had elapsed since the ship sailed from leghorn and sicily had already been passed by when the heavens grew overclouded and everything portended a storm the captain whom wagner had placed in charge of his vessel adopted all the precautions necessary to encounter the approaching tempest and soon after the sun went down on the seventh night a hurricane suddenly swept the surface of the mediterranean the ship bent to the fury of the gust her very yards were deep in the water but when the rage of that dreadful squall subsided the gallant bark righted again and bounded triumphantly over the foaming waves a night profoundly dark set in but the white crests of the billows were visible through the dense obscurity while the tempest rapidly increased in violence and all the dread voices of the storm the thunder in the heavens the roaring of the seas and the gushing sounds of the gale proclaimed the fierceness of the elemental war the wind blew not with that steadiness which the skill of the sailor and the capacity of the noble ship were competent to meet but in long and frequent gusts of intermittent fury now rose the gallant bark on the waves as if towering toward the starless sky in the utter blackness of which the masts were lost then it sank down into the abyss the foam of the boiling billows glistening far above on all sides amidst the obscurity what strange and appalling noises are heard on board a ship labouring in a storm the cracking of timber the creaking of elastic planks the rattling of the cordage the flapping of fragments of sails the failing of spars the rolling of casks got loose 
and at times a tremendous crash throughout the vessel as if the whole framework were giving way and the very sides collapsing and amidst those various noises and the dread sounds of the storm the voices of the sailors were heard not in prayer nor subdued by terror but echoing the orders issued by the captain who did not despair of guiding nay fighting as it were the ship through the tumultuous billows and against the terrific blast again a tremendous hurricane swept over the deep it passed but not a spar remained to the dismantled bark the tapering masts the long graceful yards were gone the cordage having snapped at every point where its support was needed snapped by the fury of the tempest as if wantonly cut by a sharp knife the boats the crew's last alternative of hope had likewise disappeared the ship was now completely at the mercy of the wild raging of the winds and the fury of the troubled waters it no longer obeyed its helm and there were twenty men separated all save one from death only by a few planks and a few nails the sea now broke so frequently over the vessel that the pumps could scarcely keep her afloat and at length while it was yet dark though verging toward the dawn the sailors abandoned their task of working at those pumps vainly did the captain endeavour to exercise his authority vainly did wagner hold out menaces and promises by turn death seemed imminent and yet those men who felt that they were hovering on the verge of destruction flew madly to the wine stores then commenced a scene of the wildest disorder amidst those desperate men and even the captain himself perceiving that they could laugh and shout and sing in the delirium of intoxication rushed from the side of wagner and joined the rest it was dreadful to hear the obscene jest the ribald song and the reckless execration sent forth from the cabin as if in answer to the awful voices in which nature was then speaking to the world but scarcely had a faint gleam appeared in the orient sky not quite a gleam but a mitigation of the intenseness of the night when a tremendous wave a colossus amongst giants broke over the ill-fated ship while a terrible crash of timber was for a moment heard in unison with the appalling din of the whelming billows wagner was the only soul on deck at that instant but the fury of the waters tore him away from the bulwark to which he had been clinging and he became insensible when he awoke from the stupor into which he had been plunged it was still dusk and the roar of the ocean sounded in his ears with deafening din but he was on land though where he knew not rising from the sand on which he had been cast he beheld the billows breaking on the shore at the distance of only a few paces and he retreated further from their reach then he sat down with his face toward the east anxiously awaiting the appearance of the morn that he might ascertain the nature and the aspect of the land on which he had been cast by degrees the glimmering which had already subdued the blackness of night into the less profound obscurity of duskiness grew stronger and a yellow lustre as of a far distant conflagration seemed to struggle against a thick fog then a faint roseate streak tinged the eastern horizon growing gradually deeper in hue and spreading higher and wider the harbinger of sunrise while simultaneously the features of the land on which wagner was thrown began to develop themselves like spectres stealing out of complete security till at length the orient luster was caught successively by a thousand lofty pinnacles of rock and finally the majestic orb itself appeared lightening up a series of verdant plains delicious groves glittering lakes pellucid streams as well as the still turbulent ocean and the far-off mountains which had first peeped from midst the darkness fair and delightful was the scene that thus developed itself to the eyes of wagner but as his glance swept the country which rose amphitheoretically from the shore not a vestige of the presence of man could be beheld no smoke curled from amidst the groves no church spire peeped from amongst the trees nor had the wilderness of nature been disturbed by artificial culture he turned toward the ocean there was not a trace of his vessel to be seen but further along the sand lay a dark object which he approached with a shudder for he divined what it was nor was he mistaken it was a swollen and livid corpse of one of the sailors of his lost ship wagner's first impulse was to turn away in disgust but a better feeling almost immediately animated him and hastening to the nearest grove he broke off a large bough with which he hollowed a grave in the sand he deposited the corpse in the hole throwing back the sand which he had displaced and thus completed his christian task 
during his visit to the grove he had observed the delight that the trees were laden with fruit and he now returned thither to refresh himself by means of the banquet thus bountifully supplied by nature having terminated his repast he walked further inland the verdant slope stretched up before him variegated with flowers and glittering with morning dew as he advanced the development of all the features of that land lakes and woods hills undulating like the sea in sunset after hours of tempest rivulets and crystal streams each with its own peculiar murmurs but all of melody groves teeming with the most luxurious fruit of the tropics and valleys carpeted with the brightest green varied with nature's own embroidery of flowers the development of this scene was inexpressibly beautiful far surpassing the finest efforts of creative fancy wagner seated himself on a sunny bank and fell into profound meditation at length glancing rapidly around he exclaimed aloud as if in continuation of the chain of thoughts which had already occupied his mind oh if nisida were here here in this delicious clime to be my companion what happiness what joy never should i regret the world from which this isle for an isle it must be is separated never should i long to return to that communion with men from which we should be cut off here would the eyes of my nisida cast forth rays of joy and gladness upon everything around here would the sweetest transitions of sentiment and feeling take place nisida would be the island queen she should deck herself with these flowers which her fair hands might weave into wildly fantastic arabesques. oh all would be happiness a happiness so serene that never would the love of mortals be more truly blessed but alas he added as a dreadful thought broke rudely upon this delightful vision i should be compelled to reveal to her my secret the appalling secret of my destiny that when the period for transformation came round she might place herself in safety wagner stopped abruptly and rose hastily from his seat on the sunny bank the remembrance of this dreadful fate had spoiled one of the most delicious waking dreams in which he had ever indulged and dashing his hands against his forehead he rushed wildly toward the chain of mountains which intersect the island but suddenly he stopped short for on the ground before him lay the doublet of a man a doublet of the fashion then prevalent in italy he lifted it up examined it but found nothing in the pockets then throwing it on the ground he stood contemplating it for some minutes could it be possible that he was in some part of italy that the ship had been carried back to the european continent during the tempest of the night no it was impossible that so lovely a tract of land would remain uninhabited if known to men the longer he reflected the more he became convinced that he was on some island hitherto unknown to navigators and on which some other shipwrecked individual had probably been cast why the doublet should have been discarded he could well understand as it was thick and heavy and the heat of the sun was already intense although it was not yet near than the meridian raising his eyes from the doublet which had occasioned these reflections he happened to glance toward a knot of fruit trees at a little distance and his attention was drawn to a large bough which hung down as if almost broken away from the main stem he approached the little grove and several circumstances now confirmed his suspicion that he was not the only tenant of the island at that moment the bough had been forcibly torn down and very recently too several of the fruits had been plucked off the little sprigs to which they had originally hung still remaining and bearing evidence to this fact but if additional proof were wanting of human presence there it was afforded by the half-eaten fruits that were strewn about wagner now searched for the traces of footsteps but such marks were not likely to remain in the thick rich grass which if trampled down would rise fresh and elastic again with the invigorating dew of a single night the grove where wagner observed the broken bough and the scattered fruits was further from the shore than the spot where he had found the doublet and he reasoned that the man whoever he might be had thrown away his garment when overpowered by the intensity of the heat and had then sought the shade and refreshment afforded by the grove he therefore concluded that he had gone inland most probably toward the mountains whose rocky pinnacles of every form now shone with every hue in the glorious sunlight overjoyed at the idea of finding a human being in a spot which he had first deemed totally uninhabited 
and filled with the hope that the stranger might be able to give him some information relative to the geographical position of the isle and even perhaps aid him in forming a raft by which they might together escape from the oasis in the mediterranean wagner proceeded toward the mountains by degrees the wondrous beauty of that scene became wilder more imposing but less bewitching and when he reached the acclivities of the hill the groves of fruits and copses of myrtles and citrons of vines and almond shrubs were succeeded by woods of mighty trees further on still the forest ceased and ferdinand entered on a wild region of almost universal desolation yet forming one of the sublimest spectacles that nature can afford the sounds of torrents as yet concealed from his view and resembling the murmur of ocean's waves inspired feelings of awe and it was now for the first time since he entered on the region of desolation having left the clime of loveliness nearly a mile behind that his attention was drawn to the nature of the soil which was hard and bituminous in appearance the truth almost immediately struck him that there was a volcano amongst those mountains of which he was ascending and it was the lava which had produced that desolation and which cold and hardened formed the soil whereon he walked it was now past midday and he seated himself once more to repose his limbs wearied with the fatigues of the ascent and overcome by the heat that was there intolerable at the distance of about two hundred yards on his right was a solitary tree standing like a sign to mark the tomb of nature's vegetation upon this tree his eyes were fixed listlessly and he was marvelling within himself how that single scion of the forest could have been spared when the burning lava whenever the eruption might have taken place had hurled down and reduced to cinders its verdant brethren suddenly his attention was more earnestly riveted upon the dense and wide-spreading foliage of that tree for the boughs were shaken in an extraordinary manner and something appeared to be moving about amongst the canopy of leaves in another minute a long unmistakable appalling object darted forth a monstrous snake suspending itself by the tail to one of the lower boughs and disporting playfully with its hideous head toward the ground then with a sudden coil it drew itself back into the tree the entire foliage of which was shaken by the horrible gambolings of the reptile wagner remembered the frightful spectacle which he had beholden in ceylon and an awful shudder crept through his frame for although he knew that he bore a charmed life yet he shrank with a loathing from the idea of having to battle with such a horrible serpent starting from the ground he rushed flew rather than ran higher up the acclivity and speedily entered on a wild scene of rugged and barren rocks but he cared not whether the windings of the natural path which he now pursued might lead him since he had escaped from the view of the hideous boa constrictor gambling in the solitary tree wearied with his wanderings and sinking beneath the oppressive heat of the sun wagner was rejoiced to find a cavern in the side of a rock where he might shelter and repose himself he entered and lay down upon the hard soil the sounds of the torrents which rolled still unseen amidst the chasms toward which he had approached full near produced a lulling influence upon him and in a few minutes his eyes were sealed in slumber when he awoke he found himself in total darkness he started up collected his scattered ideas and advanced to the mouth of the cavern the sun had set but outside the cave an azure twilight prevailed and the adjacent peaks of the mountains stood darkly out from the partially though faintly illuminated sky while wagner was gazing long and intently upon the sublime grandeur of the scene a strange phenomenon took place first a small cloud appeared on the summit of an adjacent hill then gradually this cloud became more dense and assumed a human shape oh with what interest what deep enthusiastic interest did ferdinand contemplate the spectacle for his well-stored mind at once suggested to him that he was now the witness of that wondrous optical delusion called the mirage some human being in the plain on the other side of that range of mountains was a subject of that sublime scene might it not be the individual of whom he was in search the owner of the doublet but ah wherefore does wagner start with surprise the shadow of that human being as it gradually assumed greater density and a more defined shape in a word as it was now properly developed by the reflection of twilight wore the form of a female were there then many inhabitants on the opposite side of the mountains or was there only one female she whose reflected image he now beheld he knew not but at all events the pleasure of human companionship seemed within his reach the presence of the doublet had convinced him that there was another man upon the island 
and now the mirage showed him the semblance of a woman vast colossal like a dense dark shapely cloud stood that reflected being in the sky for several minutes it remained thus and though wagner could trace no particular outline of features yet it seemed to him as if the female were standing in a pensive attitude but as the twilight gradually subsided or rather yielded to the increasing obscurity the image was aborted likewise in the growing gloom until the dusky veil of night made the entire vault above one of deep uniform purple hue then wagner once more returned to the cavern with the resolution of crossing the range of hills on the ensuing morn end of section forty one Section forty two of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter forty one The Island Queen. Oh, how beautiful, how enchantingly beautiful seemed Nisida, as her delicate feet bore her glancingly along the sunny banks of the crystal stream, to the soft music of its waters. How the slight drapery which she wore set off the rich undulations of that magnificent form how the wreaths and garlands and fantastically woven flowers became the romantic loveliness of her person that glowing hebe of the south holding in her fair hand a light slim wand and moving through the delicious vale with all the soft abandonment of gait and limb which feared no intrusion on her solitude she appeared that mediterranean island's queen what though the evening breeze disporting with her raiment lifted it from her glowing bosom she cared not no need for sense of shame was there what though she laid aside her vesture to disport in the sea at morn no furtive glances did she cast round no haste did she make to resume her garments for whose eye save that of god beheld her but was she happy alas there were moments when despair seized upon her soul and throwing herself on the yellow sand or on some verdant bank she would weep oh she would weep such bitter bitter tears that those who have been forced to contemplate her character with aversion must now be compelled to pity her yes for there were times when all the loveliness of that island seemed but a hideous place of exile an abhorrent monotony which surrounded her grasped her clung to her hemmed her in as if it were an evil spirit having life and the power to torture her she thought of those whom she loved she pondered upon all the grand schemes of her existence and she felt herself cut off from a world to which there were so many ties to bind her and in which she had so much to do then she would give way to all the anguish of her soul an anguish that amounted to the deepest blackest despair when her glances wildly swept the cloudless horizon and beheld not a sail no nor a speck on the ocean to engender hope but when this tempest of grief and passion was past she would be angry with herself for having yielded to it and in order to distract her thoughts from subjects of gloom she would bound toward the groves light as a fawn the dazzling whiteness of her naked and polished ankles gleaming in contrast with the verdure of the vale one morning after nisida had been many many days on the island she was seated on the sand having just completed her simple toilet on emerging from the mighty bath that lay stretched in glassy stillness far as the eye could reach when she suddenly sprung upon her feet and threw a frightened look round her had she possessed the faculty of hearing it would be thought that she was thus startled by the sound of a human voice which had at that instant broken upon the solemn stillness of the isle a human voice emanating from a short distance behind her as yet she saw no one but in a few moments a man emerged from the nearest grove and came slowly toward her he was dressed in a light jerkin trunk breeches tight hose and boot in all as an italian gentleman of that day save in respect to hat and doublet of which he had none neither wore he a sword by his side nor carried any weapons of defence and it was evident he approached the island queen with mingled curiosity and awe perhaps he deemed her to be some goddess endowed with the power and the will to punish his intrusion on her realm or peradventure his superstitious imagination dwelt on the tales which sailors told in those times how mermaids who fared on human flesh dwelt on the coasts of uninhabited islands and assuming the most charming female forms lured into their embrace the victims whom shipwreck cast upon their strand and instead of lavishing on them the raptures of love made them the prey of their ravenous moors whatever were his thoughts the man drew near with evident distrust 
but now why does nisida's countenance become suddenly crimson with rage why rushes she toward the stores which still remained piled up on the strand and wherefore with the rapidity of the most feverish impatience does she hurl the weapons of defence into the sea all save one naked sword with which she arms herself because her eagle glance quicker than that of the man who was approaching her has recognized him ere he has even been struck with a suspicion relative to who she is and that man is stefano verina now nisida summon up all thine energies to aid thee for a strong a powerful a remorseless man devoured with lust for thee is near and thou art so ravishingly beautiful in thy aerial drapery and thy wreaths of flowers that an anchorite could not view thee with indifference ah stefano starts stops short advances the suspicion has struck him the aquiline countenance those brilliant large dark eyes that matchless raven hair that splendid symmetrical maturity of form and withal that close compression of the vermilion lips o oh, nisida have been scanned in rapid detail by the brigand nisida he exclaimed yes it is she and he bounded toward her with outstretched arms but the sharp sword was presented to his chest and the lady stood with an air of such resolute determination that he stopped short gazing upon her with mingled wonderment and admiration heavens he had never beheld so glorious a specimen of female loveliness as that whereon his eyes were fastened fastened beyond the possibility of withdrawal how glossy black was that hair with its diadem of white roses how miserably poor appeared the hues of the carnations and the pinks that formed her necklace when in contrast to her flushing cheeks how dingy were the lilies at her waist compared with her heaving breast the reason of the brigand reeled his brain swam round and for a moment it seemed to him that she was not a being of this world not the nisida he had known and carried off from italy but a goddess another and yet the same in all the glory of those matchless charms which had hitherto ravished no maddened him and now the spirit of this bold and reckless man was subdued subdued he knew not how nor wherefore but still subdued by the presence of her whom he had deemed lost in the waves but who seemed to stand before him with flowers upon her brow and a sharp weapon in her hand radiant too with loveliness of person and terrible with the fires of hatred and indignation yes he was subdued overawed rendered timid as a young child in her presence and sinking upon his knees he exclaimed forgetful that he was addressing nisida the deaf and dumb oh fear not i will not harm thee but my god take compassion on me spurn me not look not with such terrible anger upon one who adores who worships you how is it that i tremble and quail before you i once so reckless so rude but oh to kiss that fair hand to be your slave to watch over you to protect you and all this but for thy smiles in return i should be happy supremely happy remember we are alone on this island and i am the stronger i might compel you by force to yield to me to become mine but i will not harm you no not a hair of your head if you will only smile upon me and you will require one to defend and protect you yes even here in this island apparently so secure and safe for there are terrible things in this clime dreadful beings far more formidable than whole hordes of savage men monsters so appalling that not all thy courage nor all thy energy would avail thee a single moment against them yes lady believe me when i tell thee this for many many days have i dwelt a lonely being on the other side of this isle beyond that chain of mountains remaining on that shore to which the wild waves carried me on the night of shipwreck but i hurried away at last i dared all the dangers of mighty precipices yawning chasms and roaring torrents the perils of yon mountains rather than linger on the other side for the anaconda lady is the tenant of this island the monstrous snake the terrible boa whose dreadful coils if wound round that fair form of yours would crush it into a hideous loathsome mass stefano had spoken so rapidly and with such fevered excitement that he had no time to reflect whether he were not wasting his words upon a being who could not hear them until exhausted and breathless with the volubility of his utterance he remembered that he was addressing himself to nisida the deaf and dumb but happily his appealing and his supplicant posture had softened the lady for toward the end of his long speech a change came over her countenance and she dropped the point of her sword toward the ground 
stefano rose and stood gazing on her for a few moments with eyes that seemed to devour her his mind had suddenly recovered much of its wonted boldness and audacity so long as nisida seemed terrible as well as beautiful he was subdued now that her eyes had ceased to dart forth lightnings and the expression of her countenance had changed from indignation and resolute menace to pensiveness and a comparatively mournful softness the bandit as rapidly regained the usual tone of his remorseless mind yes he stood gazing on her for a few moments with eyes that seemed to devour her then in obedience to the impulse of maddening desire he rushed upon her and in an instant wrenched the sword from her grasp but rapid as lightning nisa bounded away from him ere he could wind his arms around her and fleet as the startled deer she hastened toward the groves stefano still retaining the sword in his hand pursued her with a celerity which was sustained by his desire to possess her and by his rage that she had escaped him but the race was unequal as that of a lion in chase of a roe for nisida seemed borne along as it were upon the very air leaving the groves on her left she dashed into a vale along the sunny bank of the limpid stream she sped on on toward a forest that bounded the valley at the further end and rose amphitheoretically up toward the regions of the mountains stefano verina still pursued her though losing ground rapidly but still he maintained the chase and now the verge of the forest is nearly gained and in its mazes nisida hopes to be enabled to conceal herself from the ruffian whom by a glance hastily cast behind from time to time she ascertains to be upon her track but oh whither art thou flying thus wildly beauteous nisida into what appalling perils art thou rushing as it were blindly for there in the tallest tree on the verge of the forest to which thou now art near there amidst the bending boughs and the quivering foliage one of the hideous serpents which infests the higher region of the isle is sporting the terrible anaconda the monstrous boa whose dreadful coils if wound round that fair form of thine would crush it into a loathsome mass end of section forty two section forty three of wagner the werewolf by george w m reynolds this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter forty two the temptation the anaconda in the meantime ferdinand wagner was engaged in the attempt to cross the chain of mountains which intersected the island whereon the shipwreck had thrown him he had clambered over rugged rocks and leapt across many yawning chasms in that region of desolation a region which formed so remarkable a contrast with the delicious scenery which he had left behind him and now he reached the base of a conical hill the summit of which seemed to have been split into two parts and the sinuous tracks of the lava streams now cold and hard and black adown its sides convinced him that this was the volcano from whose rent crater had poured the bituminous fluid so fatal to the vegetation of that region following a circuitous and naturally formed pathway round the base he reached the opposite side and now from a height of three hundred feet above the level of the sea his eyes commanded a view of a scene as fair as that behind the range of mountains he was now for the first time convinced of what he had all along suspected namely that it was indeed an island on which the storm had cast him but though from the eminence where he stood his view embraced the immense range of the ocean no speck in the horizon no sail upon the bosom of the expanse imparted hope to his soul hunger now oppressed him for he had eaten nothing since the noon of the preceding day when he had plucked a few fruits in the grove on the other side of the island he accordingly commenced a descent toward the new region which lay stretched before him fair as even fairer than the one which had first greeted his eyes but he had not proceeded many yards amidst the defiles of the rugged rocks which nature had piled round the base of the volcano when he found his way suddenly barred by a vast chasm on the verge of which the winding path stopped the abyss was far too wide to be crossed save by the wing of the bird and in its unfathomable depths boiled and roared a torrent the din of whose eddies was deafening to the ear wagner retraced his way to the very base of the volcano and entered another defile but this also terminated on the edge of the same precipice again and again did he essay the various windings of that scene of rock and crag but with no better success than at first 
and after passing a considerable time in these fruitless attempts to find a means of descent into the plains below he began to fear that he should be compelled to retrace his way into the region of verdure which he had quitted the day before and which lay behind the range of mountains but the thought of the hideous snake which he had seen in the tree caused a cold shudder to pass over him then in the next moment he remembered that if the region on one side of the mountain were invested with reptiles of that terrible species it was not probable that the forests which he beheld as it were at his feet were free from the same source of apprehension still he had hoped to find human companionship on this side of the mountains which he had so far succeeded in reaching the companionship of the man who had cast away the doublet and of the woman whom he had seen in the mirage and was it not strange that he had not as yet overtaken or at least obtained a trace of the man who thus occupied a portion of his thoughts if that man were still amongst the mountains they would probably meet if he had succeeded in descending into the plains below the same pathway that conducted him thither would also be open to wagner animated with these reflections and in spite of the hunger which now sorely oppressed him wagner prosecuted with fresh courage his search for a means of descent into the lovely regions that lay stretched before him when he was suddenly startled by the sound of a human voice near him my son what dost thou amidst this scene of desolation were the words which uttered in a mild benignant tone met his ears he turned and beheld an old man of venerable appearance and whose beard white as snow stretched down to the rude leathern belt which confined the palmer's gown that he wore holy anchorite exclaimed wagner for such i must deem thee to be the sound of thy voice is most welcome in this solitude amidst the mazes of which i vainly seek to find an avenue of egress thus it is oft with the troubles and perplexities of the world my son answered the hermit that world which i have quitted for ever and dost thou dwell in this desolate region asked fernand my cave is hard by returned the old man for forty years have i lived in the heart of these mountains descending only into the plains at long intervals to gather the fruits that constitute my food and then he added in a tone which despite the sanctity of his appearance struck cold and ominous to the very heart of wagner and then too at the risk of becoming the prey of the terrible anaconda thou sayest holy hermit exclaimed fernand endeavouring to conquer a feeling of unaccountable aversion which he had suddenly entertained toward the old man thou sayest that thy cave is hard by in the name of mercy i beseech thee to spare me a few fruits and a cup of water for i am sinking with fatigue hunger and thirst follow me young man said the hermit and he led the way to a cave opening from a narrow fissure in the rock the anchorite's abode was as wagner had expected to find it rude and cheerless a quantity of dry leaves were heaped in one corner evidently forming the old man's couch and in several small hollows made in the walls of rock were heaps of fruit fresh and inviting as if they had only just been gathered on the ground stood a large earthen pitcher of water upon this last object did the thirsty wagner lay his left hand but ere he raised it he glanced hastily round the cave in search of a crucifix in the presence of which he might sign the form of the cross with his right hand but to his astonishment the emblem of christianity was not there and it now struck him for the first time that the anchorite wore no beads round his waist young man i can divine your thoughts said the hermit hastily but drink eat and ask a blessing presently thou art famished pause not to question my motives i will explain them fully to thee when thy body is refreshed with that pure water and those delicious fruits water shall not pass my lips nor fruits assuage the cravings of hunger until i know more of thee old man exclaimed wagner a terrible suspicion flashing to his mind and without another instant's hesitation or delay he made the sign of the cross a yell of rage and fury burst from the lips of the false anchorite while his countenance became fearfully distorted his eyes glared fiercely his whole aspect changed and in a few moments he stood confessed in shape attire and features the demon who had appeared to ferdinand in the prison of florence fiend what wouldst thou with me exclaimed wagner 
startled and yet unsubdued by this appearance of the evil spirit amidst that region of desolation mortal said the demon in his deepest and most serious tones i am here to place happiness happiness ineffable within thy reach nay be not impatient but listen to me for a few moments twas my power that conducted thy ship amidst the fury of the storm which he whose name i dare not mention raised to the shores of this island twas my influence which yesterday as thou wast seated on the sunny banks filled thine imagination with those delicious thoughts of nisida and it was i also who in the wonders of the mirage showed thee the form of the only female inhabitant of this isle and that one female wagner that woman who is now as it were within thy reach that lovely being whose presence on this island would teach thee to have no regret for the world from which you are separated and whose eyes would cast forth rays of joy and gladness upon everything around that charming lady who has already decked herself with those flowers which her fair hands have woven into wildly fantastic arabesques that being is thy nisida the island queen fiend you mock you this evening cried fernand wildly hovering between joyous hope and acute fear did i deceive thee wagner when i showed thee thy nisida in the power of the corsairs said the demon with a smile of bitter sardonic triumph i tell thee then that nisida is on this island there in the very region into which thou wouldst descend but to which thou wilt find no avenue save by my aid nisida is here on this island exclaimed fernand in an ecstasy of joy yes and stefano the bandit likewise added the demon it was his doublet which you found it was he who slaked his thirst with the juice of the fruits which i then invisible beheld thee contemplate with attention stefano here also cried wagner o nisida to thy rescue and he bounded forth from the cave and was rushing madly down one of the tortuous defiles leading toward the chasm when the voice of the demon suddenly caused him to stop short fool insensate mortal said the fiend with a derisive laugh how canst thou escape from these mountains but tarry a moment and behold thy nisida behold also her persecutor who lusts after her thus speaking he handed wagner a magic telescope which immediately brought the most remote objects to a distance of only a few yards then what a delicious scene met ferdinand's eyes he beheld nisida bathing in the sea sporting like a mermaid with the wavelets plunging into the refreshing depths then wringing out the water from her long raven hair now swimming and diving then wading on her feet unconscious that a human eye beheld her at length she came forth from the sea beauteous as a venus rising from the ocean and a toilet commenced upon the sand but scarcely had she decked herself with the flowers which she had gathered early in the morning for the purpose when she startled and rose up and then wagner beheld a man approaching her from the nearest grove that is stefano verina murmured the demon in his ears fernand uttered a cry of dismay and threw down the telescope you may save her save her yet said the demon speaking in a tone of unusual haste in a few minutes she will be in his power he is strong and desperate be mine and consent to serve me and in a moment nisida shall be clasped in thy arms the arms of thee her deliverer no no i will save her without thine aid dread fiend exclaimed wagner a prey to the most terrible excitement the making the sign of the cross he rushed forward to leap the yawning chasm his feet touched the opposite side but he lost his balance reeled and fell back into the tremendous abyss while the demon again baffled and shrinking in horror from the emblem of christianity disappeared with cries of rage and vexation down down fell wagner turning over and over in the hideous vacancy and clutching vainly at the stunted shrubs and dead roots which projected from the rugged sides of the chasm in another moment he was swallowed up by the boiling torrent but his senses did not leave him and he felt himself hurried along with the furious speed of the mad waters thus nearly a minute passed and then his headlong course was suddenly arrested by the boughs of a tree which having given way at the root bent over into the torrent he clutched to the boughs as if they were arms stretched out to rescue him he raised himself from amidst the turbid waters 
and in a few moments reached a bank which shelved upward to the edge of a dense forest precisely on the opposite or inner side there was an opening in the rocks and wagner's eye could trace upward a steep but still practicable path doubtless formed by some torrent of the spring which was now dried up amidst the mountains above that path reaching to the very basis of the volcano thus had circumstances permitted him to exercise his patience and institute a longer search among the defiles formed by the crags and rocks around the conical volcano he would have discovered a means of safe egress from that region without daring the desperate leap of the chasm desperate even for him although he bore a charmed life because his limbs might have been broken against the rugged sides of the precipice between the opening to the steep path just spoken of and the shelving bank on which wagner now stood there was so narrow a space that the bent tree stretched completely across the torrent thus any one descending from the mountains by the natural pathway might cross by means of the tree to the side which ferdinand had gained this then must have been the route by which the villain stefano emerged from the mountains he said to himself and the fiend deceived me when he declared that i could not reach the plains below without his aid such were his reflections as he hurried up the shelving bank and when he reached the summit his glance embraced a scene already described to the reader for flying wildly on toward the forest was his beautiful nisida scattering flowers in her whirlwind progress those flowers that had ere now decked her hair her neck and her waist at some distance behind her was the bandit stefano with sword in hand he still maintained the chase though breathless and ready to sink from exhaustion not an instant did wagner tarry upon the top of the bank which he had reached but darting toward nisida who was now scarce fifty yards from him he gave vent to an ejaculation of joy she saw him she beheld him and her speed was checked in an instant with the overpowering emotion of wonder and delight then as he hurried along the verge of the forest to encounter her to fold her in his fond embrace to protect her she once more sprung forward with outstretched arms to fly into his arms which were open to receive her but at that instant there was a horrible rustling amidst the foliage of the huge tree beneath which she was hastening on a monstrous snake darted down with a gushing sound and in another moment the beauteous form of nisida was encircled by its hideous coils then fled that wondrous self-command which for long years she had exercised with such amazing success then vanished from her mind all the strong motives which had induced her to undertake so terrible a martyrdom as that of stimulating the loss of two faculties most dear and most valuable to all human beings and with a cry of ineffable anguish she exclaimed ferdinand save me save me end of section forty three Section forty four of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter forty three Nisida and Wagner. Oh, with what astonishment and joy would Wagner have welcomed the sound of that voice, so long hushed, and now so musical even in its rending agony, had not such an appalling incident broken the spell that for years had sealed the lips of his beloved but he had no time for thought there was not a moment for reflection nisida lay senseless on the ground with the monster coiled around her its long body hanging down from the bough to which it was suspended by the tail simultaneously with the cry of anguish that had come from the lips of nisida exclamations of horror burst alike from wagner and stefano the latter stood transfixed as it were for a few moments his eyes glaring wildly on the dreadful spectacle before him then yielding to the invincible terror that had seized upon him he hurled away the sword knowing not what he did in the excitement of his mind and fled but the gleaming of the naked weapon in the sunbeams met wagner's eyes it fell and darting toward it he grasped it with a firm hand resolving also to use it with a stout heart then he advanced toward the snake which was comparatively quiescent that portion of its long body which hung between the tree and the first coil that made it round the beauteous form of nisida alone moving and this motion was a waving kind of oscillation like that of a bell rope which a person holds by the end and swings gently but from the midst of the coils the hideous head of the monster stood out its eyes gleaming malignantly upon wagner as he approached 
suddenly the reptile doubtless alarmed by the flashing of the bright sword disengaged itself like lightning from the awful embrace in which it had retained the lady nisida and sprung furiously toward fernand but the blow that he aimed at its head was unerring and heavy its skull was cloven in two and it fell on the long grass where it writhed in horrible convulsions for some moments although its life was gone words cannot be found to describe the delirium of joy which wagner felt when having thus slain the terrible anaconda he placed his hand on nisida's heart and felt that it beat though languidly he lifted her from the ground he carried her in his arms to the bank of the limpid stream and he sprinkled water upon her pale cheeks slowly did she recover and when her large black eyes at length opened she uttered a fearful shriek and closed them again for with returning life the reminiscence of the awful embrace of the serpent came back also but wagner murmured words of sweet assurance and consolation of love and joy in her ears and she felt that it was no dream but that she was really saved then winding her arms around fernand's neck she embraced him in speechless and still almost senseless trance for the idea of such happy deliverance was overpowering amounting to an agony which a mortal creature could scarcely endure oh nisida at length exclaimed wagner was it a delusion produced by the horrors of that scene or did thy voice really greet mine ears ere now there was a minute's profound silence during which as they sat upon the bank of the stream locked in a fond embrace their eyes were fixed with fascinating gaze upon each other as if they could not contemplate each other too long he in tenderness and she in passion yes fernand said nisida breaking that deep silence at last and speaking in a voice so mellifluously clear so soft so penetrating in its tone that it realized all the fond ideas which her lover had conceived of what its nature would be if it were ever restored yes fernand dearest fernand she repeated you did indeed hear my voice and to you never again shall i be mute wagner could not allow her time to say more he was almost wild with rapture his nisida was restored to him and no longer nisida the deaf and dumb but nisida who could hear the fond language which he addressed to her and who could respond in the sweetest most melting and delicious tones that ever came from woman's lips for a long time their hearts were too full alike for total silence or connected conversation and while the world from which they were cut off was entirely forgotten they gathered so much happiness from the few words in which they indulged and from all that they read in each other's eyes that the emotions which they experienced might have furnished sensations for a lifetime at length she scarcely knew how the subject began although it might naturally have arisen of its own spontaneous suggestion nisida found herself speaking of the long period of deception which she had maintained in relation to her powers of speech and hearing thou lovest me well dearest fernand she said in her musical italian tones and thou wouldst not create a pang in my heart then never seek to learn wherefore when at the still tender age of fifteen i resolved upon consummating so dreadful a sacrifice as to affect dumbness the circumstances were indeed solemnly grave and strangely important which demanded so awful a martyrdom but well did i weigh all the misery and all the peril that such a self-devotion was sure to entail upon me i knew that i must exercise the most stern the most remorseless the most inflexible despotism over my emotions that i must crush as it were the very feelings of my soul that i must also observe a caution so unwearied and so constantly wakeful that it would amount to a sensitiveness the most painful and that i must prepare myself to hear the merry jest without daring to smile or the exciting narrative of the world's stirring events without suffering my countenance to vary a hue oh i calculated i weighed all this and yet i was not appalled by the immensity of the task i knew the powers of my own mind and i did not deceive myself as to their extent but ah how fearful was it at first to hear the sounds of human voices and dare not respond to them how maddening at times was it to listen to conversation in which i longed to join and yet be compelled to sit like a passionless statue 
but mine was a will of iron strength a resolution of indomitable power even when alone when i knew that i should not be overheard i never essayed the powers of my voice i never murmured a single syllable to myself so fearful was i lest the slightest use of the glorious gift of speech might render me weak in my purpose and strange as it may seem to you dearest fernand not even on this island did i yield to the temptation of suddenly breaking that long that awful silence which i had imposed upon myself and until this day one human being only save myself was acquainted with that mighty secret of ten long years and that man was the generous-hearted the noble-minded dr duras he it was who aided me in my project of simulating the forlorn condition of the deaf and dumb he it was who bribed the turnkeys to admit me unquestioned to your cell in the prison of the ducal palace and for years perhaps should i have retained my wondrous secret even from you dearest fernand for through dangers of many kinds in circumstances of the most trying nature have i continued firm in my purpose adjuring the faculty of speech even when it would have saved me from much cruel embarrassment or from actual peril thus when the villain stefano verina bore me away by force from my native city i maintained the seal upon my lips trusting to circumstances to enable me to escape from his power without being compelled to betray a secret of such infinite value and importance to myself but when i found that i was so narrowly watched at leghorn that flight was impossible i seriously debated in my own mind the necessity of raising an alarm in the house where i was kept a prisoner for two whole days and then i reflected that i was in the power of a desperate bandit and his two devoted adherents who were capable of any atrocity to forward their designs or prevent exposure lastly when i was conveyed at dead of night on board the corsair ship the streets were deserted and the pirates with whom stefano was leaved thronged the port i therefore resigned myself to my fate trusting still to circumstances and retaining my secret but that incident of to-day oh it was enough to crush energies ten thousand times more powerful than mine it was of so horrifying a nature as to be sufficient to loose the bands which confine the tongue of one really dumb and a strong shudder convulsed the entire form of nisida as she spoke thus by her own words recalled so forcibly to mind that terrible event which had broken a spell of ten years duration fernand pressed her to his bosom exclaiming o oh, beloved nisida how beautiful dost thou appear to me how soft and charming is that dear voice of thine let us not think of the past at least not now for i also have explanations to give thee he added slowly and mournfully then in a different and again joyous tone he said let us be happy in the conviction that we are restored to each other let this be a holiday nay more he added sinking his voice almost to a whisper let it be the day on which we join our hands together in the sight of heaven no priest will bless our union nisida but we will plight our vows and god will accord us his blessing the lady hid her blushing and glowing countenance on his breast and murmured in a voice melodious as the music of the stream by which they sat ferdinand i am thine thine for ever and i am thine my beauteous nisida thine for ever as thou art mine exclaimed wagner lifting her head and gazing on her lovely blushing face as on a vision of heaven no she is mine thundered the voice of the forgotten stefano and in a moment the bandit flung himself upon wagner whom he attempted to hurl into the crystal but deep river ferdinand however caught the arm of the brigand and dragged him along with him into the water while a terrific scream burst from the lips of nisida then furious was the struggle that commenced in the depths of the stream but stefano lay beneath wagner who held him down on the pebbly bottom in another moment nisa herself plunged into the river with the wild hope of aiding her lover to conquer his foe or to rescue him from the grasp which the bandit maintained upon him with the tenacity that was strengthened rather than impaired by the agony of suffocation but she rose again to the surface in an instant by the indomitable influence of that instinct for self-preservation which no human being when immersed in the deep water can resist if the art of swimming has been attained again she dived to succour her lover 
but her aid even if she could have afforded any was no longer necessary for ferdinand rose from the crystal depths and bore his nisa to the bank while the corpse of the drowned bandit was carried away by the current wagner and nisida were now the sole human inhabitants of that isle the king and queen of the loveliest clime on which the sun shone toward the seashore they repaired hand in hand and having partaken of the fruits which they gathered in their way they set to work to form a hut with the planks cordage and canvas of the wreck it will be remembered that nisida had saved the carpenter's tools and thus the task became a comparatively easy one by the time the sun went down a tenement was formed rude it is true but still perfect enough to harbour them in a clime where the nights were warm and where the dews prevailed only in the verdant parts of the isle then with what joyous feelings did nisida deck the walls of the hut with a tapestry of flowers and prepare the bridal couch with the materials which she had saved from the wreck softly and sweetly shone the moon that night and as its silver rays penetrated through the crevices of the little cottage so hastily and so rudely formed they played kissingly upon the countenances of the happy pair who had wedded each other in the sight of heaven end of section forty four section forty five of wagner the werewolf by george w m reynolds this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter forty four alessandro francatelli in order that the reader should fully understand the stirring incidents which yet remain to be told it is necessary for us to explain certain particulars connected with alessandro francatelli the brother of the beautiful flora it will be recollected that this young man accompanied the florentine envoy to constantinople in the honourable capacity of secretary some years previous to the commencement of our tale alessandro was strikingly handsome tall well formed and of great physical strength his manners were pleasing his conversation agreeable to a degree indeed he had profited so well by the lessons of the excellent-hearted father marco that his mind was well stored with intellectual wealth he was moreover a finished musician and played the violin at that period a rare accomplishment to perfection in addition to all these qualifications he was a skilful versifer and composed the most beautiful extemporaneous poetry apparently without an effort but his disposition was by no means light or devoted to pursuits which worldly-minded persons would consider frivolous for he himself was worldly-minded keen shrewd far-seeing and ambitious he deplored the ruin which had overtaken his family and longed ardently to rebuild its fortunes adding thereto the laurels of glory and the honours of rank the situation which he enjoyed in the establishment of the florentine envoy appeared to him the stepping-stone to the attainment of these objects but the embassy had not been long settled at constantinople when alessandro found that his master was one who being ignorant himself was jealous of the talents displayed by others great interest alone had procured the envoy the post which he held as negotiator plenipotentiary with the ottoman port on behalf of the republic of florence and the turkish reis effendi or minister of foreign affairs soon perceived that the christian ambassador was quite incompetent to enter into the intricacies of treaties and the complex machinery of diplomacy but suddenly the official notes which the envoy addressed to the resi effendi began to exhibit a sagacity and an evidence of far-sighted policy which contrasted strongly with the imbecility which had previously characterized those communications it was at that period a part of the policy of the ottoman port to maintain spies in the household of all the foreign ambassadors residing in constantinople and through this agency the resi effendi discovered that the florentine envoy had condescended to avail himself of the brilliant talents of his secretary alessandro francatelli to infuse spirit into his official notes the resi effendi was himself a shrewd and sagacious man and he recognised in the abilities evinced by the youthful secretary those elements which if properly developed would form a great politician the turkish minister accordingly resolved to leave no stone unturned in order to entice so promising an individual into the service of the sultan to accomplish this object indirect means were at first attempted and the secret agents of the minister sounded alessandro upon the subject he listened to them at first in silence but not unwillingly they grew bolder and their speech became more open he encouraged them to lay bare their aims 
and they hinted to him how glorious a career might be opened to him were he to enter the service of the high and mighty sultan soliman the magnificent who then sat upon the proud throne of the ottoman empire the more attentively alessandro listened the less reserved became those who were instructed to undermine his fidelity toward his master the florentine envoy they represented to him how christians who had abjured their creed and embraced the moslem faith had risen to the highest offices even to the post of grand vizier or prime minister of the empire alessandro was completely master of his emotions he had not studied for some years in the school of diplomacy without learning how to render the expression of his countenance such as at any moment to belie the real state of his feelings he did not therefore suffer the spies and agents of the resi effendi to perceive how deep an impression their words had made upon him but he said and looked enough to convince them that the topics of their discourse would receive the most serious consideration at his hands his mind was already made up to accept the overtures thus made to him but he affected to hesitate for he saw that his services were ardently longed for and he resolved to drive as advantageous a bargain as possible he was one afternoon lounging through the principal bezestine or bazaar when he was struck by the elegant form imposing air and rich apparel of a lady who rode slowly along upon a mule attended by four female slaves on foot the outlines of her figure shaped the most admirable symmetry he had ever beheld and though her countenance was concealed by a thick veil in accordance with the custom of the east yet he seemed to have been impressed with an instinctive conviction that the face beneath that invidious covering was eminently beautiful moreover the eyes whose glances flashed through the two holes which were formed in the veil so as to permit the enjoyment of the faculty of sight were gloriously brilliant yet black as jet once too when the lady had raised her delicate white hand sparkling with jewels to arrange the folds of that hated veil alessandro caught a rapid effervescent glimpse of a neck as white as snow the little procession stopped at the door of a merchant's shop in the bazaar the slaves assisted the lady to dismount and she entered the warehouse followed by her dependents the mule being left in charge of one of the numerous porters who thronged in the bezestine alessandro lingered near the door and he beheld the merchant displaying various pieces of rich brocade before the eyes of the lady who however scrupulously retained the dense veil over her countenance having made her purchases which were taken charge of by one of her slaves the lady came forth again and alessandro forgetting that his lingering near now amounted to almost an act of rudeness was chained to the spot lost in admiration of her elegant gesture her beautiful yet dignified carriage and the exquisite contour of her perfect shape her feet and ankles appearing beneath the full trousers that were gathered in just at the commencement of the swell of the leg were small and beautifully shaped and so light was her tread that she scarcely seemed to touch the ground on which she walked as the lady issued from the door of the merchant shop she cast a rapid but inquiring look toward alessandro though whether in anger or curiosity he was unable to determine for the eyes only could he see and it was impossible for him to read the meaning of the glances they sent forth when unassisted by a view of the general expression worn by her countenance at the same time accident however favoured him far more than he could have possibly anticipated at the very moment when the lady's head was turned toward him she tripped over the cordage of a bale of goods that had shortly before been opened beneath the painted awning over the front of the shop and she would have fallen had not alessandro sprung forward and caught her in his arms she uttered a faint scream for her veil had shifted aside from its proper position and her countenance was thus revealed to a man and that man evidently by his dress a christian instantly recovering her self-possession she readjusted her veil gave a gentle but graceful inclination of the head toward alessandro mounted her mule by the assistance of the slaves and rode away at a somewhat hasty pace alessandro stood gazing after her until she turned the angle of the nearest street and it struck him that her glance was for an instant cast rapidly back toward him ere she disappeared from his view and no wonder that he stood thus rooted to the spot following her with his eyes for the countenance which accident had revealed to him was already impressed upon his heart it was one of those lovely georgian faces oval in shape and with a complexion formed of milk and roses which have at all times been prized in the east as a very perfection of female beauty a face which without intellectual expression possesses an ineffable witchery and all the charms calculated to fascinate the beholder 
the eyes were black as jet the hair of a dark auburn and luxuriantly rich in its massive beauty the lips were of bright vermilion and between them were two rows of pearl small and even the forehead was high and broad and white as marble with the delicate blue veins visible through the transparent complexion alessandro was ravished as he reflected on the wondrous beauty thus for a moment revealed to him but his raptures speedily changed to positive grief when he thought how improbable it was that this fair creature would ever cross his path again he entered the warehouse made a small purchase and inquired casually of the turkish merchant if he knew who the lady was the reply was in the negative but the merchant informed alessandro that he had no doubt the lady was of some rank from the profound respect with which her slaves treated her and from the readiness with which she paid the prices demanded of her for the goods she had purchased turkish ladies generally being notorious for their disposition to drive a hard bargain with traders alessandro returned to the suburb of pura in which the mansion of the florentine embassy was situated his mind full of the beautiful creature whose countenance he had seen for a moment and whose soft form he had also for a moment a single moment held in his arms he could not apply himself to the duties of his office but feigned indisposition and retired to the privacy of his own apartment and never did that chamber seem so lonely so cold so cheerless his entire disposition appeared to have become suddenly changed he felt that the world now contained something the possession of which was positively necessary to his happiness one sole idea absorbed all his thoughts the most lovely countenance which in his estimation he had ever seen was so indelibly reflected in the mirror of his mind that his imagination could contemplate naught besides he knew not that whenever he went abroad he was watched by one of the spies of the resi effendi and he was therefore surprised when on the following day that secret agent of the minister whispered in his ear coristi and thou loves and it depends on thyself whether thou wilt be loved in return alessandro was stupefied at these words his secret was known or at least suspected he questioned the individual who had thus addressed him and found that the incident of the preceding day was indeed more than suspected it was known he besought to know who the lady was but the spy would not or could not satisfy him he however promised that he would endeavour to ascertain a point in which alessandro appeared to be so deeply interested the intriguing spirit of turkish dependence is notorious the reader will not therefore be surprised when we state that in a few days the spy made his appearance in alessandro's presence with a countenance denoting joyous tidings the young italian was impatient to learn the results of the agent's inquiries i know not who the lady is was the reply but this much i have to impart to you signor that she did not behold you the other day with indifference that she is grateful for the attention you paid in offering your aid to save her from perhaps a serious accident and that she will grant you a few moments interview this evening provided you assent to certain conditions to be imposed on you respecting the preliminary arrangement for your meeting name them name them exclaimed alessandro wild with joy and almost doubting whether he were not in the midst of a delicious dream then you will consent to be blindfolded whilst being conducted into her presence that you maintain the most profound silence while with those who will guide you to her abode and that you return from the interview under the same circumstances i should be unworthy the interest which she deigns to manifest in my behalf were i to refuse compliance with those terms answered alessandro an hour after sunset said the spy you will meet me at the gate of the mosque of selimia and with those words he hurried away leaving the young florentine in a state of excited hope amounting to a delirium of joy alessandro was well aware that adventures such as the one in which he found himself suddenly involved were by no means uncommon in the east and that ladies of the most impeachable virtue as well as of the highest rank frequently accorded interviews of this private nature to those men who were fortunate enough to merit their attention such visits being the first step towards matrimonial connections but then he remembered that he was a christian and the fair object of his devotion was probably of the moslem faith what then would be the result was some wealthy lady of high rank about to abandon her creed for his sake or would the sacrifice of his faith be required as the only condition on which his complete happiness might be achieved he knew not cared but little it was sufficient for him that he was to meet the charming being whose image had never once quitted his mind from the first moment he had seen her in the bezestein 
even before the appointed hour was alessandro pacing the square in front of the splendid temple which the sultan selim the conqueror of egypt had erected and which bore his imperial name at length the agent for whom he waited made his appearance this man though actually a turkish dependent in the service of the florentine envoy was as before stated neither more nor less than one of the numerous spies placed by the rezi effendi round the person of that ambassador alessandro was aware of this in consequence of the offers and representations that had been made to him through the means of this agent and though the youth suspected that the man knew more concerning the beauteous idol of his heart than he had chosen to admit yet he had seen enough to convince him of the inulity of questioning him on that head it was therefore in silence that alessandro followed his guide through several by-streets down to the margin of the waters of the golden horn there a boat in which two rowers and a female slave were seated was waiting here you must be blindfolded said the spy for a few moments alessandro hesitated in regret that he had gone so far with this adventure he had heard fearful tales of dark deeds committed on the waters of the bosphorus and the golden horn and he himself when roving during his leisure hours along the verdant banks of those waters had seen the livid corpse float with the tale-telling bow-string fastened round the neck the spy seemed to divine his thoughts you hesitate signor he said then let us retrace our way but remember he added in a low tone that were treachery intended it would be as easy to perform the deed where you now stand as on the bottom of that starlit gulf alessandro hesitated no longer but suffered himself to be completely hooded in a cap which the spy drew over his countenance he was then conducted into the boat and guided to a seat next to the female slave the spy leapt upon the strand and the boatmen plied their oars and the skiff shot away from the bank no one uttering a word end of part one End of section 45